This week we'll be hearing from Fabian Hartst, who is currently the supervisor of the biomechanics lab at Johannes Gutenberg University in Germany. And he stayed up very late to give us this seminar, so we're, we're grateful to have him. Fabian received his diploma in sports engineering in 2008 from Otto von Gerke University, also in Germany. Following, he pursued a PhD advised by Wolfgang Schollmer. His dissertation focused on machine learning insights into the persistence of highly automized movements. His research interests include exploring the uniqueness of movement patterns of each person and person-specific adaptations to interventions. His proudest scientific accomplishment is his latest paper titled Explaining Machine Learning Models for Clinical Gait Analysis. His future plans are to develop a robust and trustworthy machine learning-based decision support approach for practitioners in biomechanical gait analysis that considers individual needs of persons. A fun fact about Fabian is he prefers to go on vacation by overnight sleeper trains. As a reminder, I'll first turn it over to Fabian for his presentation, and then we'll have a question and answer period to follow. And I'll remind everyone how to submit a question at that time. And with that, Fabian, you're welcome to start sharing your screen and begin when you're ready. Looks great. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, yeah, thank you, Emily, for the kind introduction and um, as well to all of you for the opportunity to present our work here at the HBL seminar. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce um, the concept of explainable artificial intelligence to you with an example from the field of image classification. So on the left side, um, of the slide, um, you can see an image depicting a viaduct, but also objects like a house or trees. Let's say we want to classify um, this image. Um, therefore, we can, for example, use um, a trained machine learning model like a deep neural network for image classification. And in our example, um, the model predicts the class viaduct. On the one hand, yeah, that's already a great achievement. Um, however, one of the downsides of current or state-of-the-art machine learning models is their black box nature. This means that the user of the, of the model um, cannot easily understand why a prediction was made um, by the model. Um, that's the reason why the field of explainable artificial intelligence or explainable AI emerged in recent years. So the field of explainable AI provides methods for explaining machine learning models um, and provides explanations for their predictions. Um, in this example, on the right side of the slide, layer-wise relevance propagation was used to obtain an explanation why the image was classified as a viaduct. The red region uh, in this explanation uh, shows um, why the classification model chooses the class viaduct. So the red regions highlights yeah, the regions that are relevant for, for the classification. And we see that the arc is the most relevant feature and that makes as well sense to me because I would probably use uh, a similar feature for the classification of the viaduct. So these are the pixels that were most relevant for the classification of the model. Um, in machine learning approaches, I have been as well used increasingly in the classification of biomechanical gate data. And I think most of you uh, will sometimes hear, have heard about one or two uh, applications of machine learning uh, models. And so we would like to obtain similar explanations for this kind of data as we saw on the image of the slide before. Um, since explainability methods have not been used so far for biomechanical data, we wanted to demonstrate the possibility as well as the usefulness for explainable AI methods for this field. In the last years, we have published papers on different datasets and as well 
on different classification tasks. So for, for person classification, gender classification, and gait disorder classification. And today I would like to show some insights um, that we have get out of them. So before doing so, I would like to describe in a little more detail the general workflow we used in our papers. So in our initial explainable AI um, paper on person classification, we used a sample of 57 healthy subjects. Um, each of them walked uh, 20 times the distance of 10 meters while marker information and force plate data were measured. And the subjects were asked to um, walk barefoot at self-selected walking speed. Um, we calculated the ground reaction forces as well as full body joint ankles for one stride of each trial. And afterwards, we time normalized, um, scaled and vectorized the data. So here you can now um, see the input vector that we used for the classifications. So for the ground reaction force data here, uh, shown in, um, in blue, we first concatenated the signals anterior posterior, media lateral, and then the vertical of the right foot, and then the ones of the, of the left foot. We provided this one-dimensional input vector to the machine learning model here, a deep neural network, and trained it for person classification. In this example, um, we provided the data from subject number six to the model, and the model predicted the correct class, as you can see here. But similar to our initial example, we don't know why this prediction was made by the model. So to tackle this problem, we used a well-known explainable AI method called layer-based relevance propagation and adopted it for our data, so for one-dimensional input data. As a result, for each input value of the input vector, layer-based relevance propagation determines a relevance score for the prediction of the model. So in our example, um, you see the yellow and the red uh, color coding and that highlights the most relevant input features for the prediction of subject number six. And we will now take a closer look um, at those relevance um, scores by answering some questions. So the first one is, which input features do machine learning models use for their predictions? So that was kind of the first questions that, that we had ourselves. On the upper part um, of the figure, um, you see the vectorized input signals of the lower body uh, joint angles for subject number six. And in the lower part, you see the corresponding relevance scores for each of the input values. So according to the layer as relevance propagation. Um, what we can observe um, is that the highest relevance scores are not randomly distributed uh, across the input vector, but rather we see certain points or certain reads and see in the signal with high relevance for the classification. The same applies to the ground reaction force data. So the input relevance scores highlight that the vertical ground reaction force during the terminal stance phase here and here is most relevant for the classification of subject number six. And that is an observation that we can see across all the classification tasks that we um, yeah, have done so far. So we found that multiple signal regions and not single input values are relevant for the predictions of machine learning models. We then wanted to know, okay, do different machine learning methods use similar signal regions for their prediction? And so in this slide, um, um, you see in the, in the upper panel of the figure, the vector is ground reaction force uh, signals of all trials of one of the participants, so subject uh, 28. So these are again, our vectorized input data. And below in each of the panels, you see the relevant scores for one of the machine learning methods that we applied. In most cases, the input vector um, relevant scores agree to a large ex extent between all the different machine learning methods that we used. This means that the models pick up on similar signal regions for their prediction. Only one example here shows a disagreement with the other um, methods. Um, differences can as well be seen um, in the variance between the trials. So the variance of the input relevance scores from different trials. 
So for example, the highest variance can be observed for the linear artificial neural network. And the lowest variance of input relevance scores can be observed um, for the linear support vector machine, as well as for the convolutional neural networks. So those information might be useful if you want to find a suitable machine learning um, uh, method for your task. And what we found as well is that um, if a machine learning um, method has a lower variance in the input relevance values, it is correlating as well with the um, robustness of the performance. If you add yeah, some noise on the test data, the models with um, the lower variance here in the explanations as well have a better performance um, on noisy test data. So then we wanted to go on and ask the question, which class specific features do machine learning models learn to classify persons? So until now, I only showed you um, explanations for individual gate trials of a particular class. And now we want to address the question, okay, which class specific features do the machine learning models learn to classify the person in this case? I provide here the example of four participants and by comparing the input relevance scores um, from the different subjects, um, we can now highlight which ground reaction force characteristics are unique to an individual subject. Um, the input relevance scores point out uh, which features were most relevant for the identification of an individual, and they thereby reveal the unique signature of a certain subject. Um, the comparison of the input relevance scores from different subjects indicates that individuals were classified by both different gate characteristics or the same gate characteristics, but then with a different shape or a different magnitude of the gate features. So, for example, the highest input relevance scores for the prediction of um, subject 21 can be seen here in the medial lateral ground reaction force at approximately 10% of the send phase, while for yeah, subject number six or 28, um, the vertical ground reaction force was most relevant. Another interesting observation um, that we did is that input relevance scores from all subjects point out symmetries between right and left uh, foot. So this finding indicates um, that symmetries between left and right body side are important for person classification, or at least for person classification models um, that are trained um, using machine learning. In addition to the person classification, um, we also investigated um, class specific characteristics uh, that are learned by machine learning models um, on clinical gate data. Um, for our experiments, we um, used a subset of a publicly available data set called GateRack. Um, I will briefly go um, through the figure with you. So, um, this is now the, the data for the classification of healthy controls and, and gait disorders. And we as well use different classification methods here. So the one I present you here is the convolutional neural network, and it achieved the prediction accuracy on 88% for this task for the distinction of healthy controls and, and gait disorders. In subfig A, we depicted the, the mean waveforms for, for both classes. In subfigure B, uh, we see the averaged relevance scores for the healthy control uh, class. And in subfigure C, we see the average relevance scores for the gait disorder class. So um, something we need to uh, consider here is that this one is now a binary classification task and the relevance scores are complementary. So features that are really relevant for the healthy control class are High, highly irrelevant or speak against um, the gate disorder class. And as well for this um, task, we, we found that multiple signal regions are relevant for the classification of healthy control and gate disorders. And something interesting from our point of view was that signal regions of the horizontal forces were as well relevant for the classification and as well signals belonging to the unaffected body site they're relevant for the classification. We then wanted to know, okay, are these regions that are 
um, identified as relevant according to layer as relevance propagation, also statistically significantly different between the two classes. So in the background, um, for each of the subfigures, we now visualize the results of statistical parametric mapping as a gray box. So the gray boxes um, indicate the, the signal regions where significant differences were found by SPM between the two classes. So healthy control versus uh, gate disorders. And now in, in subfigure D, um, we visualized as well for the comparison the effect size computed um, as Pearson's correlation coefficient in green and the total relevance, um, which is the sum of the absolute relevance values of both classes that are shown in subfigures uh, B and C. So the total relevance is the purple line in this subfigure. So the effect size is the SPM based result and the total relevance is the layer as relevance based propagation. Um, result. So the statistical evaluation showed a high agreement um, between the results from LRP and, and SPM. Many of the input uh, features used by the machine learning model were as well uh, significantly different between the two classes according to SPM. Um, and yeah, that resulted as well in a high um, positive correlation between the total relevance and the effect size curve. Um, I showed here two examples. Uh, so the one is the classification healthy control versus gate disorder, and as well on the bottom healthy control versus HIP, um, which was the classification task with the smallest correlation between um, LRP and SPM scores. There are also regions um, now highlighted here in, in light blue, um, where we can observe similar behavior between the total relevance and the effect size. However, um, SPM does not indicate significant different, uh, different uh, differences here. And uh, regions highlighted in red now show disagreement between LRP and SPM. Um, this is a point where we think, okay, this needs to be addressed in, in, uh, in more detail in fuser research because it's hard to yeah, judge which one is the best method. So in general, we can say, um, we can show agreement. So regions that are highly relevant for the machine learning model um, as well show statistically significant differences um, between the two classes. Then we ask as well, okay, are the relevant regions according to layer versus relevant propagation in line with clinical assessment? So in our team, we have two clinicians um, and they considered many of the relevant regions according to LRP as clinically meaningful. And here, for example, the classification task healthy control versus ankle. Um, yeah, the LRP results are as well in agreement with the work of Sun and colleagues. So they also indicated differences in the vertical and um, anterior posterior ground reaction forces during terminal stands um, between their patients with chronic in uh, ankle instability and healthy controls. And they further as well reported um, no differences in the mediolateral components. So whereas well LRP showed rather small relevance values. Another question we, we ask ourselves if machine learning models actually learn different strategies for individual participants and individual patient groups. Um, so far we have only used model explanations by, by averaging the individual prediction explanations across all the gate trials of a given class, like you saw before. Um, and we now wanted to conduct a more comprehensive um, analysis of the model explanations. And so um, we clustered all the individual uh, LRP explanations using a method called SPRAY and analyzed um, the resulting clustering. Um, we'll take a closer look um, at the subfigures for the gate disorder class here. Um, and here, please note um, that we didn't explicitly provide the, the labels hip, knee, and ankle to the model. So the classification task was just healthy control versus gate disorder, and it was not specified, or the model didn't know uh, during the training process um, that this classification included um, yeah, sub sub-disorders related to the hip, knee, and ankle. 
However, here in the subfigure D, um, we use those labels to analyze the resulting clusters from, from this prey analysis. In subfigure E, um, we see a color coding according to the participant labels. So each color here in the plot um, belongs to a unique um, person in, in the data set. And in subfigure F uh, shows the clustering um, obtained by spray. Um, and we can now see here clusters, uh, for example, um, according to spray. Um, and it highlights that they contain the samples of one of the participants. So the model learned a certain, a certain strategy to classify this participant. And there were also uh, clusters where the model learned patterns belonging to a specific subclass of the gate disorder class. So for this class, we can see that the model learned similar features for a group of uh, samples belonging to the hip class. And by looking at the participant labels, we can as well see that these explanations are belonging to two patients. So by using spray, we could show that machine learning models can learn different strategies for individuals and patient group without explicit knowledge about their yeah, participant labels or subgroups of, of a gait disorder. So to sum up um, the insight that I, I provided to you, um, we could see that machine learning models for gait classification use multiple signal regions um, for their predictions. And that is an observation that came across all the predictions or classifications we, we did so far. Um, and for the clinical gate classification, we could as well show that highly relevant regions in the input data are in most cases also um, different um, between the classes in a statistical way and that they are in line with clinical evaluation. So we have two perspectives from my point of view on, on these explainable AI uh, methods. So the one perspective is belonging to the area of machine learning. So where explainable AI methods help to understand um, machine learning models and can help to improve them by better understanding um, the influence of different pre-processing steps or the effect of data processing on the classification of a certain machine learning model. And as well, there's a biomechanics perspective um, where explainable AI, from my point of view, can provide new insights. So for example, as I showed, um, that symmetry information is really important for person classification, um, and as well that the unaffected size in the gate disorder classification um, is relevant for the machine learning models, and therefore might as well be relevant for their yeah, differentiation between gate disorder and healthy controls. So I thank you for your for your time and your patience, and um, I'm happy about comments, questions, and whatever. <laughs> Great, thank you, Fabian. Um, at this time, I'd like to encourage the audience members to turn on their video camera if they're comfortable to allow for a better discussion. Um, to ask a question, you can use the raise hand function on Zoom and I'll call on you from there. And if you're unable to do that, please feel free to type your question in the chat box and I will read it aloud. So I'll start with a, a question, Fabian. Thanks for the talk. Um, early on, uh, you showed some results where you compared the relevance across multiple models. And I was curious that if, I, I feel like we often use some sort of accuracy or performance accuracy metric to evaluate model performance. But I'm wondering that if there were multiple models that had similar accuracy, is there a way to use this explainable relevance to maybe select a model that like matches our intuition of which signals were relevant? Yeah, I think that is an important point, um, especially for practical applications. Um, so it's kind of, I think it, when you want to apply them really in practice, um, the interpretability or that the decision making of the machine learning models is comprehensible to, to a human is even more important than the performance alone. So I think no one will use a super performing model um, without getting any reasoning um, for the decision process. Um, and that's what, what I said that was really surprising for me in the beginning that the signal regions are relevant. And that from my point of view is as well and something 
they are important or where trust can yeah, increase in, in those models because the relevant informations are not randomly distributed. And from my point of view, yeah, that's something that is really important. Um, mm -hmm. Great. Um, John, please go ahead. Thanks, I get myself unmuted. So um, Fabian, I noticed that many of your relevant, whether they were vertical or media lateral uh, forces were during double stance. And you've, you've um, analyzed individual limb forces, but of course that's not what's happening to the individual. The whole body is affected by the combined uh, forces of both feet, especially during the step-to-step -step transition. Uh, have you looked at uh, doing an analysis where you're looking at whole body forces rather than just individual limb forces? Um, we actually, we only looked on the ground reaction forces um, and the joint angles. So we didn't calculate any forces um, within joints or and so no, on. I, was, I meant the ground reaction force during double stance. What's happening to the body is forces from both feet simultaneously. So the forces that are, uh, that are influencing how the body is moving are, are a combination of both feet simultaneously. And it was interesting to me that many of your relevant points on your force curves were doing during that overlap portion. Yeah. I'm in another experiment. We um, used running data. Um, and yeah, for person identification, we saw that the relevant scores were distributed over the whole stance phase there. Um, and there we didn't have the, the double support time. So, um, yeah. But functionally, in a dynamics sense, that stance, single stance in running is functionally equivalent to double stance in walking, where the center of mass is changing from going down to going back up again. Mm. Yeah, hard to, to comment for me um, on that, I think. Um, yeah, for a, a lot of these observations, we will need further research to really targeted questions with respect to the relevant scores. Um, and yeah, my point here is just to, to show or give an insight what might be possible with those methods in understanding machine learning predictions um, on, on biomechanical data. Thanks. Walter, go ahead. Thanks, Fabian. Interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, are you are you interested, uh, let's say, in the state analyses? Are you interested in recognizing a person, or are you interested in recognizing a gait? And the reason I'm asking that is, like, did you restrict the speed, or if you have a certain person, if you had me? and I walked at a slow speed and a middle speed and a very fast speed, would my patterns be preserved and you would recognize all of us that it's me? Um, yeah, I, we had uh, classifications for person identification as well on, on different days. So where as well the, the walking speed that, uh, changed for, for all of the participants. But we did not um, really treat on a treadmill the participants to have a, a, a range of walking speeds and then try to classify or identify them across those different walking speeds that were standardized. The reason I'm really asking that is uh, a, a few years ago, there was a, what I thought was a really interesting uh, keynote lecture at the Canadian Society for Biomechanics. And that person claimed in, in the talk that they could identify whether or not a given person, so me, if I was happy or anxious or depressed, and because supposedly, and it was also through gait, because supposedly the gait changed in such a way that I, as the same person, depending on my mood, would actually deliver a different profile. Yeah, we had as well observed um without any intervention changes between days. So if you come to the lab um, on, on 10 days, 
we will find um, differences that can be classified between the gate patterns of each of the days for you. So you as an individual can be classified over the days, but within the data of you, we can specify, okay, this is the data from day one and that is the data from day three, four. Seven. And can, can you associate the differences with, uh, with something that happened to the person, with a change in the person or? Uh, and this pilot study, we didn't uh, uh, control for, for those, uh, yeah, asking the persons about their sleep and their mood and so on. So we didn't, we just asked them to repeatedly come to the lab and um, try to classify um, the gate patterns. I have a couple more questions maybe at the end, but I'm seeing there's lots of hands up, so I'm stopping here. Thank you. Fabian, go ahead. Thanks, Emily, uh, and thanks, Fabian. I wanted to make a, a comment towards Walter's question um, because I thought that was quite interesting. There, there is research that suggests that we can identify the mood of an individual simply based on like point lights, right? Like if we if we um, distribute point lights all across the body and we have an individual and um, movements such as dancing, walking, or um, shaking hand, well, shaking hands, I don't remember. No, I don't think that was in there. Anyways, so if they do different movements, we can isolate their, uh, their mood based on those point lights. This study, I forgot the authors, but this study was done um, using humans to basically recognize friends and family. I think if, and Fabian, please correct me, but I think if we had the data and we had a model that was able to do the same, then those relevance scores would essentially highlight the subject specific, uh, say, characteristics that are consistent throughout different movements and also consistent throughout different days. Um, at least that's what I would assume. I'm not aware of anything or anyone who has done that, though. Um, the question that I actually wanted to ask, though, is you put a graph where you had positive and um, negative relevance scores, so red and blue, and they in, in a binary um, problem, and they were basically at the same regions, um, just kind of opposed to one another. I was curious, have you ever looked at the negative relevance scores when it's a multi-class problem? And if so, did they kind of align with positive regions in multiple other classes or were they all limited to one of the classes? Uh, to make it short, no, I didn't did never um, have a detailed look on, on all those in the multi-class classifications. I mean, what, what you can see that in the person classification, um, you have a lot more classes um, in there and the regions that are relevant are, are less. So you have a lot more signal regions that are not relevant for any of the classes um, or only for one class, because this one is then used for the identification. Um, yeah, but once it was in my mind to have a look on uh, as well on the negative values and then have a look, okay, is there some participant in the data set that has positive values there and all the others have negatives? And that is yeah, kind of searching for which combinations of features are really, yeah, just are describing the, the signature of the person. And, um, but of course, yeah, if you want to, yeah, classify models um, with respect to intervention effects and so on, then this might be interesting because then you can identify persons that, that react in a similar way and as well that react against this intervention. And as well, it's, yeah both possible to, to go into both direction then. No? Right, thanks. Carson, go ahead. Hi there, thank you for the talk. Uh, with regards to your uh, data on the gait disorders, have you done much follow-up with the people you took the data from? And do you think with any of your classifications you could sort of track how their gait is changing over time for recovery? and use or classify maybe at what stage of recovery they are just based off the gate alone compared to their own data? Um, we did not use that. So in, in our analysis here, we 
only picked um, the first session of each of the participants. Um, but in the data set we used, there are multiple sessions for all of the patients. But I think no one uh, looked at all those changes with progress of um, intervention programs and so on. But yeah, there's really a lot in there in the skate rack data set. Um, if you're interested in that, it provides ground reaction force data for really a lot of patients. Thank Hello, you. please go ahead. Fabian, let's assume you use two different variables to analyze a person, and you are interested in, let's say, a clinical situation. Let's assume that you take first the ground reaction forces, and then you take some film data or, or movement data. The ground reaction force is a very integral variable that includes many different things. The kinematics include very local information. So if you look for one specific interpretation of a clinical situation, does it depend on which variables you use? Um, in the person classification, we saw some agreement there. So for example, the uh, terminal stance phase in, in the ankle um, was important and as well the vertical um, ground reaction force in the terminal stance were um, important. So where you can see, okay, there might be something that was individual, which both variables could, could capture. Um, but yeah, one, one big challenge with all the explanations is that you don't really have this ground truth information that you need in order to say, okay, this really is a valid explanation um, because I mean, the, the area or the field is called explainable AI, but it's not really providing an, an explanation uh, in terms of causation. So it's only providing insights about the reasoning of the machine learning model. And um, yeah, the ground truth problem that you yeah, is, is always there. And um, yeah. So how does this method help them to make a better gate analysis, make better use of the data that we have? I mean, it's a good method in order, first of all, to identify biases, um, or as I showed the comparison between different machine learning models. So if you have a model um, that is uh, concentrating um, on a certain signal region, and then you put noise on, on test data or try to, to cheat the model and the model is still able to um, use the same information for the same prediction, then that, from my point of view, would assign for, for a better machine learning model. So um, I think comparisons um, are possible with this method or, yeah. Yeah, but my, my goal is to have a better gate analysis. So how do I get that? At the moment, I, I just have a different gate analysis, but I don't know that it is better. Can you, can you help me? Uh, I would be careful with the um, judgment of, of better or not better. I think um, machine learning approaches can, can provide a support for decisions in terms of an automatic reporting or highlighting certain regions that are associated with a certain risk for, for a certain injury, um, but that's it. They, they will not replace um, a person that is putting the whole picture together in gate analysis, from my point of view. But it can my highlight signal regions um, that are identified as relevant, for example, the horizontal um, forces and as well the unaffected side in the clinical classification, that might not be the primary factors at the moment in gate analysis. Right. So 
they may provide some additional information that might be useful. But it's a long way to evaluate um, if these features that I identified are really robust and if we can really trust them. So in terms of yeah, robustness. Great, Reza, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Fabian. Great presentation. Uh, I was just curious to know that uh, you're saying I have gait disorder and you got it from a source. Uh, and, you know, we've seen different gait disorders from different diseases. They, they are really different from each other. So, is there any specific disease that you're describing here? I would rather say it's unspecific because um, the labeling in the GateRack dataset um, is done belonging to different joints. So there's a, a class ankle, a class knee, and a class hip. And of course, there are several functionally completely different injuries that the person can have. Um, that not are really classified according to the joint alone. So this is a big limitation of, of this data set, but yeah, it's one of the large data sets um, that I available publicly. And I think it yeah, was for us a really nice possibility to provide some insights that machine learning models yeah, use certain characteristics that are in line with clinical assessment um, for those regions. But I completely agree on the functional level, it's completely different uh, and further research, uh, research will be necessary or in different data sets will as well be necessary to, to investigate this. Um, yeah. oh, okay, nice. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> oh, about the experiment you've done. Uh, so you have like healthy and people other group that uh, have gait disorders, yeah, and you want to classify these people. Uh, do you know the diseases for these people or they're just in general group? They, you don't know that they're, what's the source of the disease or this disorder in the experiment? Um, I think in the data set, so the GateRack data set, uh, clinicians classified um, the disorders more specific, uh, specifically. Um, but we didn't use this information, um, so. So yeah, for the subjects uh, that you had, uh, mm -hmm. I noticed that you had subjects for your experiments. Oh, so all these experiments are from another resources. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought. So on the clinical data, it. yes. Oh, um, okay. The person identification is from our own data. Yeah. Oh, okay. Nice. Thank you. Rob, please go ahead. Fabian, um, if you had a gait disorder or an injury, or whether it be even a neurological injury, where instead of now walking with a different gait that's reproducible, it's actually now um, every third step might be characteristic, and then the other steps are a bit of a bit of a, a tumble. And and so, if you're a clinician looking at it, you immediately look at it and you go, "Oh, I can see that in every fourth step, he's doing this sort of behaviour, and, and it's a floppy foot or something rather." And so, it's you can look at a neurological origin. But can the machine learning, can you make it sort of separate out or be able to discover that, that yes, it's variable, it's all over the place, but um, there is a, you know, where we can see it and pick it visually and pick it out very quickly. Is that too hard for a machine learning process? Does it, what do you think? I think it mainly depends on the on the data you are using. So with the force plates, I see your point and um, this approach um, using one or two force plates is really limited in order to get this 
variability information between the the steps um but if you use different data um for example from insoles um i think machine learning methods can as well capture those temporal um informations between steps but these are different approaches then <laughs> would it would it could it intrinsically say you know every fourth step or every now and again there's a group of steps like <clears throat> i do 100 steps and it will it pull out you know here's a group of steps behaving this way and here's a group of steps behaving differently yeah i think so or i think the the clustering of the relevant scores is maybe indicating that the machine learning model can can learn those different strategies or identify certain differences in in the gate or in the step patterns and then group them accordingly without any further information so that is really yeah one nice observation that we have from the clustering right oh in the clustering yes yeah. Yeah. thank you so because we we only classified healthy controls versus gait disorders so all disorders so the machine learning model didn't know that there are sub groups in there with uh, disorders yeah. belonging to the ankle but the model identified or found a way to learn those dependency in the data and they yeah, are trying to yeah, learn those strategies for specific disorders. Yeah, I could see in that clustering uh, plot that you had, you might have you know, green dots appearing clustered here and green dots clustered here, and it's, they're the different steps. Yes, I can yeah. see that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Walter, go ahead. Uh, maybe allow me to talk a little bit philosophy because when I saw the title about, you know, explainable uh, uh, artificial intelligence, um, I must say I expected something slightly different. And I'll give you a little story here. Many, many years ago, we used artificial neural networks to predict muscle forces that we had measured directly in animals from the corresponding electromyographical activity that we had measured in the same, in the same animals. And uh, even 30 years ago, when artificial neural networks were nothing, I assume, compared to what they're now, we could make fabulous, fabulous, fabulous predictions of dynamic muscle force changes through this pattern recognition scheme for, for uh, step cycles and conditions where the, where the artificial neural network was not trained with and even across animals. So I was really, really surprised about the powerfulness of all this. And as an engineer, I'm going, this is great. But as a scientist, I was completely disappointed because I did not understand, I could not explain why and how the relation was between the EMG and the force. It did not really provide me this input. It was a black box, as, as you said. And when you talked about explainable uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, it seems to me what you did is you identified how your pattern recognition schemes, where they zoom in and where, where they find the differences between different people, let's say, that then more clearly identify and can classify the people. And to me, that, that is not really an explanation, but it's more a description. Okay, so at the very end of the stance phase, people walk very differently and somewhere in the middle, they're all about the same and therefore the end helps me better to classify them. But the question that I would have then, why is one phase of the step cycle so different and the other ones are similar? And if I have a distinctly positive value at the end there and somebody else has a negative value, why is it? Why do I walk that way? What makes me walk that way? What's different about me compared to that? So I thought, that would be the explainable part rather than identifying in which segment you might find the differences that allow you better to classify than other segments. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. And I'm as well not, not really happy with this term explainable AI um, because I as well think it's misleading um, because those methods um, belonging to the field um, are providing insights about the decision-making of machine learning models.
but that's it. They don't provide any causation and so on. And um, so that's why I think as well, the term explaining is a bit misleading in this context. So you think uh, that in the future we can go that extra step where not only do we identify where distinct differences are, but also why they are there and why certain people or animals behave in a very different way than others and allow us to make this distinction? Uh, you always tackle the ground truth problem there. <laughs> um, and of course, we can now use those informations to more targeted um, follow-up research questions where you um, introduce as well um, yeah, maybe other variables um, to get a better picture. Um, but I think that is something that is really necessary to yeah, to interpret those relevances that we found found now. So that is kind of the human still needs to interpret those explainability results. And there the human needs some support. <laughs> because humans are very, very good at recognizing movement pattern. Uh, you know, when it's dark and I so only see a shadow, but a friend of mine is walking towards me, I, I, know, I know who it is, independent of how fast or how slow, or particularly when I was running, you know, runners have very, very distinctly different styles and, you know, you, you see a runner and recognize them. You know, I would recognize Ivo Niskanen in his classic cross-country skiing style, uh, even if it was a, just a complete shadow because he's skiing so differently than other people. I have no idea why. But I would recognize him. So, 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 so I wonder, you know, what that really is, and, and what what it makes. Not that a person is different than another, but what are the characteristics that allow that person or make that person walk or ski or run differently? Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's a philosophical question, yeah. just for the fun. <laughs> Arash, please go ahead. So uh, kind of on um, a follow-up on Walter's question. Um, so uh, we there are distinct differences between runners. And for example, I'm going to give an example of Haile Gebre Selassie, who used, to, uh, who, who used to run to school with his hands in, uh, with, with his books in his hand. And always when he runs, he has this right hand moving like this that it is quite uh, distinguishable. And everyone, every runner who knows this person, with a, as Walter mentioned, if it is just a shadow, people would know it. I was wondering if, if you have the uh, data from this person, kinematic data from this person, would your algorithm recognize this movement or would you think, do you think that it would recognize something different? I think the machine learning models, um, they are looking for the simplest solution. So um, I expect that um, yeah, they would use similar features than, than we humans would do. And so if we know a person with a very characteristic um, movement during running, I think yeah, maybe the machine learning model will as well look on, on those features, yeah. And uh, have you tried to, uh, have you tried to, so you have these people with uh, some sort of disorder and some people with no disorder, you, you had the data. And have you tried to look at the, like if a clinician looks at the gait pattern, would they recognize something similar in the, in the movement or would they, uh, would they recognize based on completely different features? Yeah, we had, um... We had two clinicians who had a look on the relevance curves um, and they could interpret some accordance with their clinical experience. Um, but of course, one of the limitations of, of this approach is that we only use the ground reaction force data. So in terms of really interpreting um, the disorders, um, yeah, I think kinematic data would, would be necessary in order to go further in interpreting the, the explanations and comparing them with clinical assessment. 
Perfect. Thank you. Carson, please go ahead. Uh, I saw that you were using sort of linear SVM and then a few, <coughs> sorry, a few convolutional neural networks there. Uh, how much do you think the time series nature of the data contributes to how uh, the AI is identifying things? Like, do you think it's considering like a certain kernel or a certain window of time, or is it taking the relation between different areas of the curves as something important as well? I think um, it's as well using, especially in the convolutional neural networks, some yeah, connections between different signal regions as well. I didn't investigate it in, in detail, um, but that's what I expect that as well the models um, will link si relevant signal regions uh, in, in higher level um, layers. Yeah. But we tried um, in a lot of experiments with different uh, filter sizes in the convolutional neural networks um, and the explainability results were really um, robust across um, those tests. All right, thank you. And I'll go ahead. So where do you think that gate analysis or movement analysis is going in the next 10 years? I mean, you have the conventional approach where you have distinct values and you have an approach that looks much more sophisticated, your approach. Where do you think that we will be in 10 years from now? How do we analyze data and how do we make conclusions? I think in 10 years, um machine learning based decision supports for clinicians um, in gate analysis will be integral part of the procedures in, in the clinical practice. So how do you get the functional information into the whole process? Let's assume again, you take ground reaction force and measure some gate disorder. And ground reaction force may or may not have the information in there. How do you add that information that you are sure that you go into the right direction? Uh, I don't think that um, such a decision support system will be based only on crowd reaction force data. But for us, it was a, a nice example to use ground reaction force because they are more robust and we were able to get a large data set which is much more difficult with, with kinematic data. And I don't know of any large-scale data set that is really available to the public um, um, that provides kinematic data. But I agree, kinematic data will play a crucial role in, in those uh, decision support systems. When I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, machine learning. I don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised that you know it. <laughs> so I, I think you know there, there is a a part that is missing at the moment in that whole analysis the part where we relate the data to a functional reason but isn't you, you know <laughs> as, as an example the research that has been done in the last maybe 10 years with respect to these shoes, the vaporfly, that increases performance so drastically. That research has not led to an explanation why we have the difference. And I think it is not because not enough people have worked on it. I think it's because the methodology that people have used is not appropriate. And in this case, I could see that that functional part is missing. Do you see that differently? Yeah, I'm asking myself it, uh, if, um, if I consider the waveforms 
of the variables. Isn't that as well something functional for you? Sorry, I didn't get that. Um, so if I consider for my classifications the dynamics of, of my variables, isn't there as well a functional component in that? I don't know. <laughs> Any other comments before we move on, Benno? No, I'm, I just don't know. Okay. Um, well, yeah, any, anybody feel free to jump in to keep that discussion or um, Dovin, please go ahead and ask your question. Sure, my, my question is a continuation. So I think um, what Benno and Walter are saying, I think I, I, I very much appreciate that um, it, it's not really showing us this, this functional reason. Um, but what does excite me about this approach, I think, is that in Benno's example, he's saying we're taking ground reaction force and kinematic signal A. Um, so we could think if we were lo looking at uh, a patient population group like uh, osteoarthritis, maybe we, we choose the adduction moment or something. So we have this a priori expectation that this is what's going to differentiate the groups. I think what's exciting about this approach to me is that we can just kind of do a shotgun approach, just blast kinematic signal A through Z, kinetic A through Z, um, and see what the machine learning algorithm uses to discriminate uh, patients and healthy controls. And maybe, maybe we're looking at the wrong signal. And then it's up to us as biomechanists to go and look at the signal that it's, that it's saying is different, is discriminating between these two patient groups and say, okay, well, why is that? And come up with a mechanistic explanation. But I think it, it's, a, it's a way to look at um, new signals and new parts of signals that maybe we've been neglecting in the past. Yeah, that's great. I'm not sure if anybody had a response to that or, or Walter, please go ahead. Yeah, just maybe a comment uh, adding to, 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 to Benos ben and, and Tovin's um, uh, comments. Um, for example, one thing that has always fascinated me, and I really don't have an explanation for it, and I'm not really sure, you know, there is people who are heel foot strikers when they run, and there's people that are four foot strikers. And if you take a classification algorithm, I'm, I'm absolutely sure there would be no problem at all recognizing that. But for many years now, <laughs> When I discovered, when I came to Benoist Lab in 1985, and I realized that I was a four-foot runner, which I never, ever thought about, but all of a sudden, they couldn't use me in the experiments because I didn't run properly. Um, I'm going, why, why did I run that way? And why are other people naturally running uh, and hit with the heel first? You know, what makes four-foot striker and rear-foot striker different? And maybe, maybe there is no generalizable uh, answer to that, but but that that would be something that a machine learning algorithm immediately would distinguish. I'm sure, but how do you get at an, a, a good answer? Why some people run this way and some people run that way, and they feel perfectly comfortable. And if I'm forced to run over my heel, I feel like I feel like an old horse. I, I feel like I'm not running. I'm feeling like I'm doing some completely different movement that has nothing to do with running. And I'm sure heel foot strikers, when they are forced to run on the forefoot, they feel exactly the same. It's very uncomfortable, very strange, and a completely different movement. But why is that? That is my question. I would like somebody to answer that. Yeah, I mean, the... There can be a variety of, of possibilities, and I think the um, the way to think is is starting from an individual level. Um, and if I have a lot of individual responses, then I can have a look on preferences, and as well having a look on do I find groups that are similar but based on the individual reactions and not the other way around. So from coming from the group or generalized. Um, way, um, because that does not allow the, the individual solutions 
um, that much. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> Person, go ahead. Uh, have you ever thought about using like somewhat of like a recursive neural network since so much of gate is responding to what situation you put yourself into based on how you've loaded your foot, how you've sort of gotten into the situation you are, and now you're responding differently depending on where you are. So using a recursive neural network where you consider everything leading up to that point. Um. I've never tried it, but yeah, of course, it's, um, that's a way to go if you want the time component more pronounced or the developmental um, progress that is happening for a, a specific sub a subject. If you want to map that better, then I think that is one of the options that you can take um, that is yeah, really fine. Do you, do you think that would help with some of the explainability where it'll tell you at what time point does the meaning change? At what time point does this person who was loading improperly becoming a person who is uh, doing takeoff poorly? Or do you think that that time component would kind of still be lost for that explanation? And it would be hard to, to get the data in order to really map those, those processes. Um, I think that's uh, the toughest challenge there. But any other questions or comments from the audience then i'll go ahead I would like to make something clear. You know, I'm excited about the whole thing too. So Dovin, you are not alone. But if I go back a little bit in time, you know, people said, instead of using one distinct variable and looking what that variable does, if we have the whole time series, then we don't lose anything. And so the, the method was developed. And then people said, yeah, the problem is that there's a black box. We don't know what the black box do, does. If we would know what the black box does, we could explain the situation. And then methods were developed that allowed to do what Fabian has done, or what both Fabians have done. And we are still at the same situation. We don't have solved, we didn't solve what we wanted to solve. We are a little bit more accurate, we are more elegant than uh, many of these things, but we haven't solved the question that we have something that tells us what the reason is that Walter runs forward. I know it, but uh, I, don't, I don't tell him. <laughs> That's clear because you are you are a track and field athlete. Most track and field athletes run on the fourth. So why because, am I track and field athlete? <laughs> no, uh, but I would like to make that clear. You know, it's a piece is missing. That's what concerns me, and I see the progress that has been made. But that piece that is missing, how do we get that? But just to add to that, just to add to that, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, Fabian. I mean, the good thing is, you know, I thought one of the good things ab about about this all was, at least to me, that, that now you have these phases in gait or in running that that seem to be really very characteristic, characteristic where you can have a better chance of distinguishing between people or between gates. And you have other phases that are more that are more similar. And, you know, now, now, you know, in the next step, you know, you can zoom in into those phases and, and maybe come up with an explanation why that is, why the variability there is so great and why uh, that particular phase allows you, uh, allows you to do that. Maybe in other parts of the, of the step cycle, you're so constrained that it doesn't allow for variability 
whereas in other phases of the gait, without you know, without falling and stumbling, and uh, you know, you can there, there's a variety is allowed. It's like when we have a cat walking on a treadmill. When we have the cat walk very very slowly, it looks around and there's all kinds of things. And the gait is never really never really the same. Every step is different. But when we have a, ga- a cat running at six meters per second on a treadmill, everything is identical because there's not really very much you can do <laughs> when, when you run on a very same treadmill at six meters per second, you know? And maybe there's a similar problem here that you have the possibility to, to vary your ground reaction force or your kinematics in some phase of the step cycle. You're not really punished. Whereas in other phases, you better not do that. And if that's indeed the case, that might be a great step forward. Some to zoom in. But I agree with you, Benno. There's more questions to be asked there. And I think the step that we have made is that we know now where to zoom in. That's the progress that has been made. But we haven't zoomed in yet. Michael, go ahead. I, th- I think I want to push back a little on what Benno and Walter have said. I think uh, like a good example is we can look at loading rate and it's, you know, association with tibial stress fractures and people have spent a lot of time going down this road of trying to use it as a, you know, discriminative measure. And what we know at this point is, you know, after two nice prospective studies have come out this year, that there doesn't seem to be a real association prospectively between loading rate and and injury or specifically tibial stress fractures. So I do worry that we can we can think about oh these these areas have been identified but you know they're just um, they're just showing you a symptom of of a gait pattern that's problematic. So you could say that high loading rates are associated with long uh, step lengths and long step lengths happen to be associated with really high muscle forces and that produces a lot of stress in the tibia, you know, at mid stance. So it's useful that I think these things, these tools can like show us maybe where to look, but I'm not so certain that where it's telling us to look is actually relevant if the information that we're measuring is not actually, you know, responsible for the injury that's occurring in this case, you know, we're measuring gait parameters rather than tibial strains. So we're, you know, we're trying to do something without actually the appropriate data to make an inference with. I just don't know where to go other than saying we need better data. <laughs> I, I would have a lot of answers there, but I'm not going to go there. So otherwise it get too long. But first of all, I would say, you know, I'm not a bone person, but I never ever would have thought as a hypothesis that loading rate would be related to tibial stress factors. I would think um, bone quality, bone mineral density or whatever is a good evaluator would be much more important for that. And then the second thing is, uh, I don't think anybody ever has measured um, uh, strains uh, on the on the human tibia everywhere. And so we don't really know what it is. Yes, we have predicted these models, but, but you know, I know people make individual muscle force predictions uh, with, um, with models. And when I put them into my animal models, I see they're hundred percent off. So, so I, so it's not that I don't think models are great, but I'd be very, very careful. Just, just, just to have a little bit fun here at the end of a nice talk. Well, I'm not saying that the modeling we do in our group is correct. I, I think Brent will be the first one to tell you that we are often way off the mark and that our deformations, you know, that we're measuring are completely different in some cases or in certain planes of, of movement than, you know, have been measured in vivo. So we, there's no, no clear answer, obviously, one way or the other, what's most appropriate. And it's really, really hard, you know. Ever since I got into biomechanics, we tried to predict these internal forces and stresses and strains. And uh, in humans, you know, in animals, in some certain circumstances, we can measure it. But in, in humans, it's, it's just really difficult, eh? It's really difficult. Great. Well, I, I think that's a, a nice time to, to wrap up our discussion. Thank you so much, Fabian, for your presentation today. And thank you to the audience members for all the questions and comments. Um, as a reminder, next week we'll have the seminar as part of the Research Revealed Symposium. It'll be the same seminar link. And I hope to see everyone again next week. <laughs>